I mean, these two things are hard work. Imagine asking everybody to drop their criticisms about you. Imagine how hard that is. Imagine doing so many good works and making up all the church services skip, all the street preaching and soul winning, Bible reading, prayer, and sacrificially giving, giving and whatnot, doing those things to make up for the ten. See, there's a lot of shame with the name. My second point is it will lurk your tomb. It will lurk your tomb. You got to realize that shame with your name will even haunt you even after you die. Didn't you know that? Even after you die, people remember who you are because they have a thing called memory. Your life, your existence may be erased, but not their memory of you. They're going to remember who you are, what flaws and mistakes that you made. It's going to haunt you in the afterlife. Let me ask you this question. When I mention about Thomas, what's usually the phrase people remember him as? Yeah, yeah. Doubting Thomas, right? I bet you right here in this passage, it's very plain. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. That's what we remember him as, right? Boy, I'm so glad that Gene Kim's name was not mentioned right there. Man, that would be so shameful for me. Man, I, wouldn't, I would be one of the last people to be in there. But here's the thing. Do you remember him as this in John 11, 16? This is the first chat. John 11 is before John 20 when Thomas doubted. So you should remember by him as this first before he doubted. But you would remember him first before he doubted. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. What a statement. What a statement Thomas made. Let's go also that we may die with him. Did you remember him that way? <laughs> As a person who was willing to sacrifice his life for Jesus Christ? No, you all remembered him as doubting. Why is that does not make sense? Why would he we remember him as doubting Thomas rather than the person who was brave enough to lay down his life for Jesus Christ? Do you know why? Because human nature, the world, tend to remember your fault more than your goodness. People will the news will glamorize more on the defect more than your goodness. What's popular on the news? The most juicy thing of what some kind of celebrity messed up with or some kind of politician, stuff like that. That would go on for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. You see, that's what human nature does. And you got to realize this. That's how bad it is when you leave a shame behind your name. Because people will tend to remember, oh, I went to church every Sunday. Oh, I went street preaching. Oh, I went soul winning. I read the Bible. Oh, I'd helped out the pastor and every member I was considerate. And it doesn't matter how much good that you've done, like Thomas, because human nature will remember that one stinking little thing that you right. slipped up in, and people will automatically remember that. You know why? Because that's human nature. Amen. That's human nature. Human nature. Yeah. See, shame leaves shame is very strongly connected with your name first kings chapter 15 verse 5 because david did that which was right in the eyes of the lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life save only in the matter of uriah the hittite wow wow despite of all the good things david did he slew a giant when no one did he stuck out and tried to serve God as best as he could when he was being persecuted by Saul. He did not return evil against Saul. David, he's done so much where he was a man after God's own heart. That's what the Bible says. A man after my own heart. And what, what in the world? Despite of that, even after he died, God would not give him a break. God would not give him a break even after he died. A man after my own heart, except that matter what he did with Uriah the Hittite. Adultery and murder. Shame. Yeah, Shame. Psalms 106, verse, <coughs> excuse me. Psalms chapter 106, verse 32. They hangered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes. 
Look at that. Despite of all the good things that Moses is known for. I mean, Moses, he split the Red Sea in half. Moses, he's the one that took care of nearly a million people. I give him a lot of credit. I, it would be a nightmare for me as a pastor to take care of nearly a million people, man. But the thing is, is that Moses, despite of all the good works that he did for the Lord and he stuck close to him after he died, it still haunted his doom. It lurked his doom. He was remembered for his anger and rebellion at the book of Psalms. It went ill with Moses for their sakes, as Psalms 106 reads. You got to realize that that's why you see why we make a big deal about testimony. Do you see why the pastor, he has very, he sets up his own personal convictions. I don't shove my personal convictions on somebody else. I have my own. But if it relates to the testimony of the church, that's when I would draw a boundary line. But in my own life, you notice that the pastor, why he would consistently always dress up like this and do that kind of stuff. Why he would have certain things in his house he's careful and all this kind of stuff. You know why? Because you got to realize this. That's how people remember you by and yeah. even God remembers you by. It will haunt you in the afterlife. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 33, please. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Testimony is essentially important. We believe that strongly. Do you know how much Satan wants to attack this church and ruin this church? Do you know how much Satan hates this church? Do you know how many times Satan has attacked us online over and over and over and over again? Do you know how many nights that your pastor here had to wake up to like four in the morning or stuff like that to set things up and make sure everything's done right so that he doesn't give an inch to the devil in case some kind of slip up or attack happens again? And then still that slip up happens during the middle of the service. Do you know why? Satan hates a Bible believing church that's trying to win souls, that's trying to open people's eyes to the truth, that is rescuing people, souls in, I'm not kidding you, in Muslim nations, in China, I'm not kidding you, in Indonesia. All parts of America, obviously, but there are people getting saved, turning to the King James Bible, to switching to dispensationalism, and going to Bible-believing Amen. churches. I just rece recently received a testimony audio of a person who got influenced by our online ministry at England, and he attends this pastor, Pastor Davis's church in England, and he posted that testimony online. That really encouraged me. This happened just a few days ago. Yeah. Robert is my witness. He helps me with the emails. He sees these people, yeah. homosexuals trying to repent of their ways, Amen. people getting right yeah. with God, lost souls saying thank you for the King James Bible, people forsaking the charismatic Pentecostal movement. You don't think Satan really That's keeps right. his eye on this church after that? Yeah. You think that, oh, no, no, not that church, not that church. They're too small. They're not that ready yet to serve God. You know what? I'll give them a break. Satan wants to crucify and ruin this church. This is why this sermon is important because you got to realize as Satan's lenses is on this church, the testimony, testimony, Amen. testimony of the church and your own life from every single word that you say, from your attitude and everything must be clean in the eyes of God and where the world can't find a fault to crucify you. Why do you think we survived as a church so far? Why do you think we survived online so far? I don't want to say that because pretty soon we might get shut down real soon. Yeah. But you got to realize this. The only reason why we survived so far is because it's so important that we maintain an attitude of testimony, testimony, testimony. And because of testimony, that's why we never had one cop who kicked us off the street. That's right. Yeah, man. Praise the Lord. Testimony. Shame, shame, shame. My brother Robert just talked with somebody. Had a bad influence from Westboro Baptist. See that? Because they remember this automatically just from one little church out in the middle of no man's land. That's enough for the whole world to crucify you. But because of our testimony where we maintained it, where we don't even leave a taint one bit, that man is able to talk to brother Robert for a long time. Today at Street Preaching. See? Because... He was careful with the testimony. Every one of us today, we're careful with our testimony yeah. in street preaching. In 2 Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 1, 
When you hear about the name of Manasseh, <coughs> who do you know him by when you hear that name Manasseh? Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. Now look at verse 9. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, and what? To do worse than the heathen, whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. You know what you know Manasseh has? The worst king out of all the kings of Israel. But didn't you know that Manasseh is more of a person who's a saved saint compared to all the other kings? What? Really? What? Really? No way. Wait, where is that, Pastor? Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. And when he was in affliction, he what? Besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Yeah, no kidding, because God was so angry and grieved with him, he whipped the fire out of him. Now look at verse 22. <coughs> but he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Manasseh his father. For Ammon sacrificed unto all the carved images which Manasseh his father had made and served them. Now isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? In verse 1, God says Manasseh did worse than all the kings. In verse uh, 1 and 9. Then in verse 12, Manasseh got right with God. Well, just like the Apostle Paul, you know, I'm not going to remember him for a lot of the tanks that he did. He's done a lot of good for me. He's a great king. No, you know what God said even after Manasseh died? In verse 22, 22, Manasseh is already dead. Give him a break. He got right with God, but God said, no, this person, this king who took over after Manasseh did as wickedly as Manasseh. You see that it lurks your tomb. Sin lurks your tomb. That's why you got to realize this. You got to realize a name is so important. That's why, you know, look, it doesn't matter if you think that, you know, all so many non-denominational non churches making everybody be loose with whatever they do. And that's why when there are heretics who come out of the church and Christians who change into atheism because those churches are not setting their, uh, their preaching as an example. They're not preaching at their members. They're not hitting their members about testimony, testimony. We're not going to allow any single sinful thing, worldly thing in the church because they didn't set that standard. That's why there are heretics who criticize those churches. That's why there are atheists who criticize those churches. Amen. You know, you know why they became that way? The pastor failed to preach to the sheep and to convict them into getting everything right with God. God forbid that this pastor will fail in his preaching of the word of God. I'm going to be held accountable. And so I'm preaching as a testimony of San Jose Bible Baptist Church. This is extremely important because if this is not covered, then I will be just like the other non-denominational churches. This must be preached. Oh, it's so hard. That's right. That's why non-denominational churches grow. You see that? It's easy. It doesn't point out your sin. It has everybody at liberty doing what they want. I could do that too. I would get so much of a break. It would get, be so much easier for me after that. But no, God forbid, because I am held accountable and I don't want some heretic online who I pointed out their sin and criticized their false doctrine, criticize me in return. Amen. I absolutely refuse. I absolutely refuse. Amen. And you got to realize this. It doesn't matter if you got humble. You got right with God. I mean, you can cry and weep on the altar today and get some things right with God, but you got to realize this, is that shame just connects so strongly with the name, people will tend to remember all the defects that you did, even if you humbled yourself. I mean, that's what happened with Manasseh. That's what happened with Manasseh. You notice that? He humbled himself. He got right with God. But then, the shame, he was more remembered. Do you see why testimony is so important in your life as a Christian? That's why Romans 14 is so important in setting up your personal convictions. Yeah. You know, there are so many people that says, give me a verse for that. Give me a verse for that. Give me a verse for that. No, you got to set something, a standard yourself That's between right. you and the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy yeah. Spirit knows a defect that will not be mentioned in the Bible. But he knows you and him know what the defect is. And so he's going to show that. He's going to convict you. And you've got to be humble enough to say, you're right. I'm wrong about that. 
you can't have pastor point out the defects in your life because the thing is, I don't know your heart and I am not the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God knows your heart and you know. All I can do is just awaken it as best as I can, but I can't do nothing more after that. All I can do is try to awaken it in you, but I can't do nothing more after that. Do you have personal convictions in your life? That is very important. I think that's a sermon right there. It's not only respecting different convictions of the people. You understand Romans 14 is more about you. You, it's not you getting a break with people respecting your conviction. No, it's about you. You got to respect the person's different conviction. Not only that, you have to set up your conviction. The very thing that you don't have your own standards, your own rules, your own morals between you and God shows how very loose you are and you want to live as freely in sin and in your flesh and your desire as much as you want. You should have standards in your life. I'm not going to go to work until I read my Bible and pray. I'm not going to do this until I do this with God. Everyone has their own standard and rule. You've got to set that up. Does that mean that I have to do it? No, I pray and read my Bible whatever time I do, actually. But see, that's the point of different convictions. Because God, the Holy Spirit, is going to deal with every person individually. And if you don't have a conviction set up, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. It shows how much you focus more on doing what you want rather than what the Holy Spirit wants. And when you go by what the Holy Spirit wants, trust me, convictions will automatically be in place. And you don't need a verse for that. You don't need a verse for that. Where's a verse where we drop the drums? Where's a verse to drop the electric guitar? Where's a verse for that? You know what? You got to have, you got to drop that attitude. Because even if God mentioned everything in the Bible, then it shows right there your lack of maturity where you and God, the Holy Spirit, walk and you set the line between you and God on what standards you should follow. You can't have so-and-so guiding you all the time, telling you to do this, telling you to do that, do this and do that, talk like this, talk like that, have this in your house, don't have this in your house. No, God forbid. This is you and God. You and God where you have to set it up. You have to be mature and grown up to do that. You have to set the standard. If you're a parent, you got to set that kind of standard for your children and not be like all the other parents here who are not safe Christians. You, if you don't, If you fail as a family person to set up a standard in your home, then your home, don't be surprised if it goes loose in the flesh and in their own desires. It's so important as a parent, as a pastor, as a person in charge of something held responsible, you set a standard. It is important to set a standard so that testimony can be preserved. Today's preaching is really hard. No kidding. I don't like this kind of preaching. But you know why I'm preaching this? Because Satan wants to crucify this ministry. The world wants to crucify this ministry. Bible-believing churches know about this ministry. And they're looking up to us. Why? I'm saying that out of arrogance. I'm the best? No, there's a lot of plenty of churches and pastors they're looking up to. But I'm saying that because we're online for all the world to see, especially on live stream, you got to realize they're watching. They're watching. I mean, they already found some imperfections with your pastor. Didn't you know that? Yeah. They already found some imper- pa- imperfections with your pastor. And if you think I got higher standards than you, oh, my goodness. I think you, you got to get some things where you got to set some standards yourself then. Yeah. My third point is it will lose your trust. It will lose your trust. Look at X. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but Exodus chapter 33, verse it reads, And Moses said unto the Lord, See... Thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now notice right here, this is a blessing. Finally, something good to hear, right? After all the things that you heard in this preaching. Here's something you want to hear. When Moses made his request to the Lord, you know what God responded? I know you. And because I know you, that's why I can answer that prayer for you. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Man, I know San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Because of that, I'm going to send in more members. Because of that, I'm going to boost up more subscribers. Because of that, I'm going to bless them with a building finally. 
Because of that, I'm going to bless them with more money. Because of that, I'm going to bless them with more facility. Because of that, I'll bless them with a nice banner. I'll bless them with live stream. You know, instead of that amateur work that uh, Gene Kim has always done on YouTube <laughs> with the poor audio and that you hear people's voices in the background, you know, yeah. about time. I'll, I'll, I'll bless him that much. You know why? You see, that's why. You know why God can bless us this much so far? You know, I just, while I was preaching, I realized, wow, how filling this area is now. And you know what? Uh, if if I could cry, I would shed tears, and I would, and I could just say in the middle of my preach, and thank you, Lord. Praise yeah. Lord. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Lord. Lord. He finally did it. Yeah. Because he knows our name. Amen. And see, name connects to this is the most important thing: trust. Trust. If your name was mentioned to God, and God had five people He would pick in Silicon Valley area. Or let's make it even more narrow. Five people in this church. Who would he pick? Mm, that's See, that's the thing. God knows enough of your name that he can put his trust on you. That's good. And name, names are so important because you got to realize this, is that if you have a high standard, your own personal conviction that is holy and right with God, and that preserves the testimony of your life, your church, your walk with God and in the eyes of the world, then the Lord knows I can trust that individual to take care of that thing for me, to take care of that ministry for me, to take care of that work for me. I don't know why, but maybe that's why God set me here at Silicon Valley because he knows how I would try to talk to the liberals. He knows how I would try to use self-control, how I could stomach it. He would remember all the sufferings and the trials that I've been through going through those things in higher education and in my personal life. And that even if every, and probably he remembers those times when I stuck out with me or one person and that I wouldn't just throw in the towel and say, this liberal area is going to hell. So I'm going to plant a church in the South, in Tennessee, where there's a lot of Baptist churches. Yeah. Am I saying that I did all those things? No, I'm saying perhaps, but I'm giving you my example here so that you can better understand yourself. Perhaps the Lord can say this about you and bless you, and that's why he gave you this particular thing in your life, because he knows he can trust you with something. But let me tell you something. This position of trust for me, because I'm preaching at myself. That's why I mention myself a lot, because I'm preaching at myself here. This pulpit, this position of trust, that camera looking at me, that position of trust does not last forever. It can be gone just like that. It can be sacrificed, boom, just like that. Do you see why name is so important? But you know what? I want the world to not say, oh, yeah, I know that name. He's the one that did blah, 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 blah. I don't want that. I don't want people in my church to say, oh, yeah, I know that name, Gene Kim. He did blah, 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 blah. I don't want that. I want it to be like how God said, I know Gene Kim. Yes, that he can pastor this area, that he will serve God, that he will not throw in the towel, that he has compassion on lost souls, that he will not compromise in sin and wrong doctrine. Oh, to God, I want that said about me. I wish he would say that about me. Will he say that about you? When these names are mentioned, what kind of good or bad things do you think about these people? So I want you to think both good and bad about the names of these people. And what's the first thing on your mind? Adolf Hitler. George Washington. John F. Kennedy. Angelina Jolie. C.I. Schofield. Charles Darwin. Buddha. Hugh Hefner. Jack Chick. Mother Teresa, Peter Ruckman, Ted Bundy, Howard Stern, Albert Einstein, Martin Luther, Gene Kim, Jack, Stan, Chris, Tom, Sean, etc. 
What good or bad thing would you think? See how people will remember you by? They will remember you by, by a certain characteristic, good or bad. Names, names. That's good, Pastor. That's good. Yeah. When these names are mentioned, can you trust them? Enough for a specific task. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's insert right here. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Testimony. 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 We get 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to read verse 10. Now, at the last hours of Paul's ministry, you know what he did? He had to leave the church. He had to die for the name of Jesus. So his ministry, he's got to entrust someone enough to take care of the ministry. So he mentioned names of people who he can trust. Now, here's the thing. You'll notice right here that at verse 10 through 15, for Demas hath forsaken me. There is a name of mistrust. Having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. So there are certain names there that Paul could entrust. Only Luke is with me, name of trust. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry, name of trust. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. Let's keep reading. Look at the names he trusted and the names he mistrusted. Keep reading, verse 13. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, that, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. 19. Salute Prissa and Aquila, and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. Last hours of Paul's ministry, before he lost his head and died for Jesus Christ, he named people who would take care of the things for him, whom he can trust to take care of those particular things for him. And you got to realize this, when the pastor is at the last hours of his ministry, when the pastor is at that point, can he name certain people who will take up the task to take care of the Sunday service, the midweek services, the visitation and street preaching? What if the next pastor comes forward? And this happens with churches. you got to realize pastors rotate. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to do that, all right? God forbid that that will ever happen, all right? I mean, I, I would sooner, Lord willing, by God's grace, I'm not saying this, but by God's grace, by God's grace, because I am weak in human flesh, that uh, I would lose my life before I leave this church for Jesus Christ. I made a determined, make a foothold, even if one person comes in, sorry, I'm going to be here. I'm going to live and die and help that person till the day I die. No matter how insignificant, how unimportant that person is, I don't care. But you got to realize this, is that pastors do rotate and take turns. And you got to realize that if this pastor were to come across an incident when there's a new pastor that comes forward, and this new pastor comes forward and he says he's going to take care of the church, he's going to ask questions, okay? He's going to ask questions, okay, so who comes to church? Who do I know will come to church? Uh, is there any people who I should take care of, someone that I should be more alert, be more careful with, someone that I could use more of a task and freely ask them to help me out with this one and, you know, take care of the building, blah, 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 blah. That's what pastors are going to do. <clears throat> what can the pastor say? When he names your name, will it be a name that he knows will be helpful to that pastor, to that leader, or someone to be careful with? Can the pastor name that certain person as trustworthy or distrustful? That's why it's so important you got to realize that names have a lot of meaning because people know your characters. That's why, why in resumes do they want to know your character with your name? 
That's all they'll know about you. Now, if we look at 2 Timothy 4, we saw that John Mark abandoned the ministry, correct? He abandoned the ministry. Uh, verse 11, verse 11, Paul says, take Mark with you. It's profitable. But if you read back at Acts 13, John Mark abandoned the ministry. As a matter of fact, Paul said, uh, when Barnabas said, let's take John Mark with us, Paul was so vehement in distrust because Paul's ministry required heavy sacrifice. Paul went through a lot. He went through a lot of criticisms and attacks, and he knew John Mark was not strong enough to handle it. So Paul was very vehement, no, okay, maybe the guy is good. Maybe he got right with God. He wants to help out the ministry, but I'm sorry. I can't have that person in the ministry because our, the kind of ministry that I'm doing has a lot of sacrifice, a lot of demonic attacks, and I don't think that person can hold it out. So for the good of that person and even for myself, so that person don't, doesn't go through unnecessary hurt and blame God and me later on, it's better that he never went through that hurt to begin with and I can't trust that person to begin with and that person doesn't take the ministry. But you know what happens? What happened later on when Paul was near the end of his life, he said, may this be you today. Only Luke with me only Luke is with me. Take Gene Kim and bring him with thee. Yeah, I know he messed up. Yeah, he slipped up. I didn't trust him before, but he is profitable, finally, to me for the ministry. There is so much shame in the name, but that doesn't mean there's zero hope. Amen. There's always hope. But you got to realize the seriousness of shame and the seriousness of your life's testimony. Because it's not just your life, it's also the church as well. you got to realize how serious the task is. John Mark, you know what he did? He was able to even write a book in your Bible. Yeah. I think God trusted him enough to write a book for him. He didn't trust Andrew and Thomas enough. He trusted John Mark. The guy who bailed out. If some of you Christians have names that bears distrust, you can redeem yourself in the end. Now, what are you going to do about it? Don't you want God to say after this altar call, take so-and-so. He is profitable for me. For yeah. this ministry yeah. in Silicon yeah. Valley yeah. to see yeah. souls getting saved, to street preach, to do visitation, to bear the fires of hell when the world tries to crucify them. They're, he's profitable. Yeah. He, she, 8-year-old, 12-year-old, 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 60-year-olds, profitable for me in San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. The altar call is open. Will you throw your name at the altar? Will you throw your name and say, God, oh, God, oh, God, here's my name, and I surrender it to you. Today was a hard sermon. If some of you were new, I want to say that I apologize if it was too hard, but I don't apologize what was preached, because this is what the Lord has led in my heart to preach to you, because we are a church that the Lord has incredibly blessed. <clears throat> and because the Lord has incredibly blessed our church, he, the devil really wants to attack this church. If our church is going to survive, we have to realize our testimony must be preserved. Our testimony must be preserved. You gotta realize there's a time in your life you gotta get some things right with God. You gotta realize there's something in your life that the world would crucify you on. It's so important to live a life of holiness that would glorify and honor the master. The master. Look, we believe that everyone has a time of growth in the Lord. So if there's a newcomer who just came in and just got saved, I don't want the person to think, oh, there's so much work, I need to get right with God. We don't want them to do things like that. We believe in proper Christian growth. A baby cannot grow when he's just tossed and made, forced to walk like that, forced to run. 
But I'm telling you something. Some of you Christians have been saved for years, know enough Bible-believing truth. You got to realize that you can't let your testimony slide anymore, and you can excuse yourself for being a baby Christian, because that makes you no different from non-denominational churches of saved Christians who've been saved for years, and because of that, their testimony is shot to pieces. It's time we get serious and right with the Lord that there will be no shame in my name, in the name of my church, and in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who I represent as an ambassador of the holy great I am that I am. Oh, to God that I would be the last person to shame that kind of name. God, my Father, thank you so much for the preaching of your word. I pray today's preaching has convicted, changed people's lives. May it glorify and honor you. And I pray that you'll please bless the fellowship and the lunch hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.